um, we'll be starting off once again. Um, now, this is not a session on predestination. This is supposed to be a session on Ephesians 1 and 2. So, you know, um, uh, we cannot get too much into detail uh, on the subject. Please, uh, you know, just to quickly address the questions which have already been posted over here. Uh, you know, um, uh, Kung asks, why Adam and Eve were placed in the garden when God knew that they would sin. Uh, so um, what we can say to that is that when God decided that he would create humans in his image, he was very serious about it. In the same way that he has free will, he has decided that even humans, human beings will be alive. And so at no point is he going to take away his image from them. He's never going to reduce them to cattle. They will always be in his image, and they will always have the dignity to have their make their own free choices. He decided that he would never take that away from them. He knew what it would cost him. He knew that because he has given them that free will to save them out of their mess, he will literally have to send his own son and sacrifice him. Jesus Christ knew what he would have to personally go through, uh, uh, you know, uh, to to save these people once they start exercising their free will. Uh, so, in spite of knowing all of that, the Godhead chooses, you know, God chooses not to uh, to withdraw His image from His people, and so. You know, he doesn't go on covering them, protecting them, keeping away from or keeping keeping them away from all temptation. Uh, and he, you know, it, rather he just sets them in front of the temptation and says, "See, this is who I am. I am a God of love. I have the very best intentions for you. Now, you use your free will because you have been created in my image. Use your free will and choose whether you will trust in me or whether you wish to fall away." And unfortunately, Adam and Eve choose to use their free will, uh, you know, and go against him. They choose not to trust him. But even then, God does not give up on them. He says, no problem. It, they've done this, but I still have a rescue plan, which I have already set in place. And so he goes through this whole painful process of crucifixion. Um, but he doesn't never ever tampers with the free will that has been given to humans. So that is how much. God respects us, uh, and He has loved us enough to create us in His image. So um, God does not just, uh, you know, prevent Adam and Eve from exercising their free will. They are allowed to. Coming to the other question about many are called but few are chosen, that would be in your uh, parable where everyone is invited to the wedding. Even people who never even had heard about the wedding, they literally pulled out of the side streets from the lanes where, you know, where, where uh, these are all beggars, these are all people uh, who are rejected by society. And they are also like literally, you know, dragged over there to the wedding to say, look, this is something that, that, is, that is available even for you, not just for the hi-fi people who were invited, you know, originally, but even for people like you. And so they're all brought over there. Op invitation is openly given to everyone. And... There's this guy who bother, who comes over there not bothering to wear the wedding garments. You know, the, the master has specified, if you want to come, you got to come in this particular way. But he is kind of mocking the privilege which has been offered. And he comes over there wearing his own clothes and not honoring the master, you know, who has invited all of them. He dishonors him by not wearing the right garments and coming, you know, something to do with their culture. And uh, so uh, they all were called. But only those who chose to respect what was being offered, those who put on the garments that were freely being given to them, they are the ones who benefit. So again, it's a matter of free will. That man chose not to wear the garment. Yes, he wanted to come and eat. He wanted to be part of the feast. He wanted to drink the wine. He wanted to enjoy. But I'll do it on my terms. I don't want to wear the garment. I'll wear what I want to wear. That was his attitude. And then you know he ends up being punished for that. So it's it's it, it comes down to free will. And there was this other question by Charles. Um, uh, so could someone predestined refuse to be called? Uh, so when we look at Romans chapter eight verses twenty nine and thirty, it's talking about God foreknowing. So God foreknew who are the people who you know who will um, be willing to be confirmed to the image of His Son. 
so he foreknows who are the people who will respond to the call he foreknows who are the people um, who will be willing to be justified so knowing that knowing that particular category of people those are the only people that he predestines to be confirmed to the image of his son so um, the whole process does not start off with predestination the whole process starts off with god knowing beforehand who are the ones who will respond positively favorably and so those are the people that he predestines but then like we always you know see um, even those who have been predestined continue to retain their free will so now just because they've been predestined it's not like as if now they are under force they are they have been pre-programmed and now they have no control over themselves and so now they have to stay in the lord no even now at this point after having been predestined you can still walk away if you wish uh, which we see you know in hebrews in hebrews chapter 6 and hebrews chapter 10 especially hebrews chapter 6 i think where it talks about those who have tasted of the heavenly gift they have shared in the holy spirit these are believers that we are talking about and if they wish to walk away yes they still have the freedom to walk away um, but you know um, the lord will do everything possible you know to bring them back to their senses uh, and if they still are stubborn and don't want to accept then that is their free will it's their free choice god will never take away that free choice from us okay so um i you probably all have a uh, many many more doubts but we really have to move on you know i um, because this um, we can't just dwell upon this one um, thing um yeah anyone who really has something very urgent to clarify um you know you could raise the question either post it there or you know uh, you can just you know unmute and ask your question um but if it is like something really i mean you 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 really need to know the answer now you know if it's like that otherwise you know we'll just kind of um, move on simply because we have um so much to cover yeah anyone with that kind of a very vital question yeah let's just you know move on uh, due to lack of time so if someone could you know read read for us an entire chunk maybe verses 11 to 14 again you have the word predestined mentioned over here uh verses 11 to 14 please can i read pastor yes in him we have abstained in her inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in christ might be to the praise of his glory in him you also when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised holy spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory okay so um god foreknew who are these people who would be responding to him so in him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him uh, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will so um the the lord knew who are the people who would be responding and uh, so in verse 13 it says you also were included in christ when you heard the message of truth god foreknew that these people when they hear the message of truth they will respond they will believe he knew that and so, so those people whom he knew will be doing that he also predestines them you know using the wording of romans 8 so he, he the, so th these are the people who get predestined and he places uh he he kind of you know it, it says you were marked in him with a seal the promised holy spirit now which over here it's not talking about any mark on the forehead that is something which happens in revelation chapter 9 verse 4 which is in the very end of end times you know so revelation 9 has not happened yet so it's not talking over here about any mark being placed on our foreheads it is it's simply saying that we are given a mark of ownership and what is that mark of ownership the holy spirit becomes our seal it's not like you have a wax wax seal or some kind of uh, seal made of some other substance which is placed on you in some manner 
literally the holy spirit who is given to you is your seal and the seal over here is talking about ownership for instance um, um in in those times you know in in biblical times uh, slaves were not sealed. I mean, the branding of human beings was not done. It was done to uh, runaway slaves, but it was not done to all people. They were not, they, had, they had not uh, become that evil in those days. Um, so, um, seal was placed more on cattle. You know, where uh, the animals would literally be branded uh, with with a seal. So, in that sense, you know, anyone who looks at that particular, um, you know, icon which has been placed on that animal, everyone would know. Okay, this this particular cow belongs to so and so. So they would know. In the same way, you know, when the principalities and powers look at us and they see the Holy Spirit in us, they know. Oh, this person is sealed with the Holy Spirit. This person, you know, bears the mark of ownership um, of God. And what is the mark of ownership that God has put upon us? The Holy Spirit. That's it. Okay. So uh, this whole again, a lot of uh, wrong doctrine has come out of this word seal, like as if it is something uh, you know which cannot be broken or torn or something. It's not some kind of um, um, some kind of substance, you know, which which God has stamped on us. No, the seal is literally the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, so. Um, if you look in your Bible hub, uh, the wording is that, uh, you know, you were marked with a seal, you know, that entire word, it's just one single word, marked with a seal is one word, uh, marked with a seal, the Holy Spirit, that's all it says. So literally the seal is the Holy Spirit himself. So um, he gives himself to us, God gives us the Holy Spirit as a seal saying that, okay, now you belong to me. And the Lord also gives the Holy Spirit to us as a um, as a guarantee, because extremely lavish promises have been made. We've been told that all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms are ours. I mean, uh, it's like almost too impossible to believe. And so, you know, it's like as if this um, um, really very rich benefactor has come to you and he has said that you know he's going to be giving you all of these billions of um of you know uh, dollars or pounds or whatever and you're like you know is it even real is it possible that someone would give me that many billions just like that without my having earned it or done anything you know for it uh, so it's like very unbelievable and so this benefactor says to you you know you're not able to believe that i'm going to give you all of these billions fine I'll give you a deposit. I'll give you one billion right now, straight up. You know, right now, I'm, I'm going to put it in front of you. Now, but this is just the beginning. So this um, one billion that I'm giving you is evidence. It is guarantee. It is the deposit that I will, you know, keep my promise and deliver all the other billions which I have, which I have promised you. So, you know, what God is promising is us is that we're going to literally dwell with Him. Uh, we're going to be his family members. Uh, we are going to rule with him in the New Jerusalem. We've been told all this, and it just sounds so amazing. And he says, you know, this is true. In fact, I will give you the whole, my, I'll give you my Holy Spirit right now, um, so that you know this will be a mark of ownership, showing to all the principalities and past that now you belong to me. And the Holy Spirit will also be like a guarantee to you that. What I'm saying, I'm not making tall promises. I'm actually going to deliver on these promises. You will actually receive what I have to offer. So uh, in that sense, the Holy Spirit has been given to us. He's been given to us to show the principalities and parts that we belong to the Lord Jesus. He's also been given to us as a deposit, as a guarantee that all the things that he has promised us will be fulfilled. It will all come to pass. And when we go to him and you know want to claim any of our spiritual riches through prayer, through faith, it will be done for us because we have the backing of the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, the Holy Spirit has been given to us. But then again, you know, I mean, just keeping in mind Hebrews chapter 6, we still have our free will. So like it says in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 12, uh, so if someone who has tasted the heavenly gift, who has shared the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God um, and the powers of the coming age, uh, so uh, and who have fallen away, 
they cannot be brought back to repentance to their loss they are crucifying the son of god all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace okay so that would be hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 to 12 uh, which talks about that entire thing so over here the holy spirit is not some kind of a seal that, that can be broken can't be broken he's a person and he's been given to us to show that what god is saying is true that god is going to keep his promises so uh, we should not exaggerate these um, you know this these concepts that have been given uh, but simply accept that the holy spirit has been given to show that we belong to him the holy spirit has been given for the other purpose of also um, you know like a deposit to guarantee uh, that we are going to receive the full inheritance in his perfect time um okay uh, then you know just quickly moving on to the next passage Mm. yeah this of course is an important passage we have to look at this uh yeah so if someone could read out for us uh verses 15 to 20. yeah ma'am Ephesians first chapter 15 to 20. for this reason because i have heard of your faith in the lord jesus and your love toward all the saints I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of our, your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in christ when he raised him up from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places yes uh now um this is what uh paul is praying for the ephesian believers so he says in verse 17 i keep asking that the god of our lord jesus christ may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that all of these things will happen for you okay so that's his prayer and uh, so when i first you know heard a sermon on this uh, they, they said you know you can pray this over yourself or you can pray this over your church um, and so i was very very excited and i came home and i sat down and i prayed this prayer i said lord i'm also just like paul asked for the ephesian believers i'm now asking for myself that you give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that i may know you better and i pray that the eyes of my heart may be enlightened in order that i may know the hope to which i was called and all of that you know so i just prayed that prayer and over the years you know once in a while i, I go back and i pray this prayer over myself and uh, so what is promised over here this is basically what is promised over here that this holy spirit he is the spirit of wisdom and revelation he will light up the eyes of our heart so that our heart can catch certain things there are four things okay so this holy spirit you know who's been given as a mark of ownership this holy spirit who has given been given to us as a guarantee the same holy spirit he is the wisdom of revelation and uh, he's, he's the spirit of wisdom and revelation what does he do for us if we pray to him he says that he will light up the eyes of our heart so that we will be able to see four things the first is we will know him better so that you may know him better it says um and uh, oh that is the first most precious thing the more you know him the more he becomes personal to you very real you know as real as, as the next person you know sitting in the room the more you the more and more real he becomes to you um the deeper and deeper your walk with god becomes i always had this idea that you know um really spiritual people are i mean i don't know that they're, they're this really fancy people who i don't know maybe they have this all these deep revelations from god or something and i had i don't know I didn't, I didn't really know what to think about all these people who are supposed to be like great spiritual people but i'm beginning to understand that um you know real maturity in god is nothing hi-fi it just gets simpler and simpler you just start getting to know him very well 
you can hear his voice more clearly you can feel his presence um in a more tangible way it all just gets very simple where he's becoming a very real person to you and so you know everything gets simple so when he says to you you know you do this and you're like oh you gosh you want me to do that it's so difficult and he says no 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 you know i'll watch it for you and he gives you a bunch of scriptures and he says you know see i'm giving you these verses if you hold on to them you will be able to do it you will have the strength to do it and then at the end of it you know you will receive your reward and it becomes a very simple relationship so growing in god is not something where you become more and more complex and high fi growing in god is something where it where it starts getting very simple because you're getting to know this person he's like a actual real person and he talks and he talks in your language in a way which you can understand and and when and when when you're down like he's there for you and it's, it's just so beautiful and it's just so simple and it's so basic you know it's like nothing high five so the most beautiful prayer that you could ever pray for yourself is you know you can you can you just pray and you say lord spirit of wisdom and revelation you know let me know him better you know if you can just pray that and even as it begins to just fill up your life you just you just experience him in such an intimate way and it's just so beautiful and that's just the first part of the prayer there's a lot more to follow sorry it's not a good thing to get emotional but it happens sometimes so the next thing that you get to know is the hope that you have been called for you've been called for an amazing purpose you know you've been called for um to to partner with him in accomplishing something divine i mean god could have just used his angels you know to accomplish his great purposes but he chooses to use humans and you will begin to discover what your purpose is and then you see you will not want to walk away from your calling because the calling that you have is something so amazing and you realize the gravity of it and the great privilege of it you don't want to walk away from it you will want to do it however hard it gets however tough it gets so you so when you pray this prayer over yourself you start getting to know him in a very real way you start discovering the purpose for which you have been called the third thing you start knowing the immense riches which are yours you begin to discover that these rema words that are being given to you they are so powerful and you can really use them uh, to walk in victory to to really uh, to really get the things that you are meant to have you know uh, as a child of god so you begin to uh, understand what are all the riches available to you even as god starts opening up those scripture verses to you and the fourth thing you discover that the literally that that resurrection power of god which raised jesus christ from the dead that resurrection power is now in your hands it's now yours it's available to you and you can use it for absolutely any godly purpose that you want you know put your hand to so um these are the four things that we can you know talk about and explain and once we talk and explain you know we get to know okay these are the things available to us but when you pray and the holy spirit reveals these four things to you at his level um you begin to operate in them so uh, what was just head knowledge starts becoming experiential knowledge and nobody ever actually arrives at these four things completely we continue to grow into them so we continue to get more and more get to know him um, better and better we draw become closer and closer to him we start uh, realizing the the hope and the purpose for which we have been called to a greater level we start uh, understanding the immensity of the riches which are available to us and you begin to claim them more and more and you begin to use this resurrection power that is available to a greater and greater extent so uh, even paul says i have not yet arrived i have not yet reached but i'm pressing on because you know these these four things he was just pressing on into them again and again probably because you know every day he would be praying this prayer over himself so i urge you you know really pray this prayer over yourself because the holy spirit is like eager to actually make those things happen
in our lives you know so um he actually wants to give us these things so it's a very lovely prayer to pray and um um uh, verses 21 to 23 talk about uh, how this resurrection power has placed Jesus Christ, uh, you know, far above all rule and authority. Um, uh, okay, yeah, let's actually read this. Yeah, we, because this 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 beauty even over here, you know, it was something important that we need to grasp. Uh, so, if someone could read out verses 21 to 23, please. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Uh -huh. So you're no longer reading the NLT. NLT is beautiful. It's, um, you know, it's very simple. It just brings those scriptures to life uh but yeah sometimes you know it kind of misses out on um, uh, so which is why we generally stick to nkjv and niv uh, because that uh, uh, the translation is tries to stick more to the original but nlt brings out the meaning sometimes so beautifully uh, so yeah over here um it says in verse 22 god placed all things under his feet under jesus christ's feet you know so uh, he was raised uh, back to life through the resurrection power. He was placed above every ruler and authority and dominion, and and all things were placed under his feet. Uh, it says he was appointed to be head over everything to the church. Uh, in NIV, it will say for the church. So he didn't need to be placed in this position of authority, right? I mean, he's God. He was, uh, you, you know, he in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus Christ was always God. Things, everything was already under his feet, always. He went through this process for us on our behalf. So you see, now we share in it. Earlier, only he had all the dominion and everything was under his feet. But now he became our representative, came here out to the earth, became our human representative, and uh, shared his victory with us as our representative. He won the victory for us, you know, on the cross, where even we have now overcome all the principalities and powers. So in him, we too have become victorious. So now he has risen back, he has resumed his throne, and everything has been placed under his feet. And now we are sharing in that. So not only are these dominions and principalities and power under his feet, uh, he is in that position of power for us. So in him, through him, we also enjoy that authority. And we can, in fact, you know, use it. Um, of course, more details are given in Galatians chapters, um, in Ephesians chapter 6, you know, uh, where we would talk about this in greater detail. But just so, just so, you know, for us to appreciate um, what has been offered to us, maybe we can dwell upon it very briefly. Uh, in even as we get into chapter two, so if someone could read out, okay, we have one more question here. Second and third thing of the Holy Spirit, you know, those four points you mean, right? It's there in your notes, you just have to open your notes, it's there. Uh, all the four points that we can have in the Holy Spirit. Um, um, yeah, uh, ch uh, chapter two, if someone could read out for us, Ephesians chapter two, verses one, two, and three, please. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. Yeah, you know, it, uh, I mean, uh, he, he reminds the believers of what they were once upon a time. He says you were spiritually dead people, you know, you, uh, uh, you had nothing. What were you? You were slaves. You were slaves of this, uh, you know, ruler of the kingdom of the air. 
it's talking basically talking about satan and all of his you know principalities and powers so uh, you know they were nothing they were under the control of this and this uh, this this the spirit of evil was you know working in them that is what they were but now you know uh, in in the previous passage right we looked now this very same spiritually dead people who were in that pathetic condition now um through jesus christ they are seated in a position of authority all everything has been placed under the feet of jesus for them and they are sharing now in his power and authority so look look how far god has brought them people who were spiritually dead people who were under the control of this ruler of the air you know satan and all of his forces such people now have power and dominion over the ruler of the air slaves have now risen up and now they can crush the one who had enslaved them you know uh, all of their lives so that is the kind of power that is given uh, you know to just go back to verse 19 it says over there his incomparably great power for us who believe so anyone who chooses to believe that jesus christ indeed has this kind of a power anyone who chooses to believe that everything has indeed been placed under the feet of jesus anyone who chooses to believe in 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 what he has the power he has they will confidently say in the name of jesus let this be done because they know that jesus actually possesses that level of power they know that everything has indeed been brought under subjugation and because they believe it they declare in jesus name let this be done but, uh, so when we you know when whenever we say you know in jesus name we are talking about what that name carries that name carries the finished work of the cross that name carries what christ jesus has accomplished for the church that name carries resurrection power so when we say you know let some purpose of god be fulfilled in the name of jesus we are saying jesus is going to do this and i believe it and therefore i am declaring that it shall be done in the name of jesus so in that way we you know we come against uh, the, the the different works of the evil one uh, for instance you know if you if you're praying for a person who is not yet saved and uh, you can see you know this uh, this what do you, what do you, what is it called it's called in um, ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 this this thing it's called the ruler of the kingdom of the air uh, the spirit of this ruler of the kingdom of the air is working in those who are disobedient and here you are who, you're you're praying for this person that they would that they should be saved and the spirit it's controlling them it's doing its works in them but you know about a different work that was done the work that was done on the cross by a greater spirit the eternal infinite holy spirit okay so you choose uh, to um, you know uh, you choose to believe in the work which jesus christ has done and so even though you can see the spirit of disobedience which is operating in this person for whom you know you are um, uh, striving you know in um, in prayer you are interceding for them you are hoping that they will be saved even as you are uh, you know praying for them you can remember that there's a greater work that has been done on the cross and because Christ Jesus has done that greater work for the salvation of all people because his will and his purpose is greater you can in jesus name cancel the works which this ruler of the air is doing in that person's life you can declare and say in jesus name i cancel the works which the evil one is doing in this person's life because i know there's a greater work that was done on the cross and jesus christ through his holy spirit will convict this person of sin and righteousness and judgment so in faith you claim through the name of jesus that this great resurrection power should be released on behalf of this person so that the holy spirit can start doing his work inside this person so what is your role in this entire thing by faith you are cancelling out what the ruler of the kingdom of air is doing and you are claiming 
what Christ Jesus has done on the cross. So you have two works, evil one's works, and you have the finished work of Jesus Christ. You can always cancel out the works of the evil one by faith in the name of Jesus, standing on what Jesus Christ has done using this finished work of Christ. So these are lesser works. These lesser works can be canceled by faith in the name of this higher one, this greater work which will prevail. These are temporary works of the evil one. They will perish. When we stand up in faith, they will perish. But this eternal work of, the, of, of Jesus Christ done on the cross, this finished work, when we claim it in the name of Jesus and in his name, we cancel this temporary work, this temporary work has to you know, be broken. So these are things that we do. So the ruler of the kingdom of the air, once upon a time he enslaved us. Now he has absolutely no authority over us. In fact, we are in a position of power with Jesus Christ and we can cancel his works. We can cancel the works of this evil spirit uh, uh, that is ruling the world. So we can you know, pray for people uh, confidently cancel the works of the evil one that are being done in that person's life so that that person will start becoming more open to the works of the Holy Spirit. You know, so you can claim people for salvation uh, in this way. Uh, so um, in the next few verses, you know, verses four to seven, a lot of wording is used to talk about um, how these people who were spiritually dead, who were nothing once upon a time. Now look at the, look at the, uh, privileges which they have. So in verse 4, it says, the great love for us that God has. The and it says he's rich in mercy. And it, it says in verse 5, he has made us alive with Christ. You know, we who were spiritually dead in our transgressions, now he has made us alive with Christ, it says. And um, then in, in verse um, 6, it says, raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So at a physical level, we are still here on the earth and we are uh, battling with all the, you know, um, uh, the challenges which we face on a daily basis. But we are doing it out of our spiritual position in Christ, because in Christ, we are seated with him. Remember, right? We, we looked at how everything has been placed under his feet for the church. And so now the church is seated with him. And because we have that authority in him, we can use his name to accomplish his purposes. When we use his name, all the power backing up that name, the finished work of the cross, which is there in that name, starts getting um, you know, operated uh, for that particular thing for which we are praying. So that power gets released. That finished work of the cross gets released for that particular thing. Uh, you know, to accomplish that particular thing for which we are praying. And obviously, we are not talking about worldly material things. We're talking about, you know, godly purposes where we are praying for someone or, we, or, or we, you know, or something bad has happened in the family and we are facing a crisis and we want God's protection and we want his provision. So we are praying for that. So I'm talking about good things. I'm not talking about greed and wealth and all of that. Okay, so, so, so people who are in total poverty have now been made um, made rich because of the great love of God. And it goes on to say in verse 7, the incomparable riches of his grace. Okay, uh, so uh, we now have all of the spiritual riches and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms, which is now, which means that now we have a high status and a high authority. So in Christ, uh, our lives have been completely turned around. Now in verse 8, was eight onwards, um, he starts, okay, verse eight is still in the, the previous portion. If someone could just read out verses eight and nine, please. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Okay, so uh, how exactly did we come to have faith in him and trust him? You see, it all begins with the work of God. God initiates the whole process. If you look, if you know, if you were to go to John chapter 16, verses 8 to 11, it talks about the work which the Holy Spirit will do when he comes. 
Okay, so the Holy Spirit is the one who actually begins the whole process. So he is in the world now, the Holy Spirit, and he is, you know, fulfilling, um, implementing the redemption plan which Jesus Christ has achieved. Uh, so he's now in the now the implementation process is going on. He is in the world and he's convicting the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And whoever is open to this, whoever is receptive to the, the work which the Holy Spirit is doing in the world, such people are given this gift of faith to believe in Jesus and place their faith in him and submit to him. So it's not something that we achieved by ourselves. All we did was we were willing to open our hearts to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us. We were willing to open our hearts and accept what he is saying about righteousness and judgment. Because you know, in our hearts, we sensed God saying, what you are doing leads to death. It is sin. It's not just compromise. It's not just a defect or a mistake. It is sin against God Almighty. And you will go to hell if you do not repent of these things. So we, 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 we heard the Holy Spirit in our hearts telling us these things. And we were open to receive that. We were open to be corrected. And because that openness was there, um, the gift of faith was given to us to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We could not have done it on our own, but it was given to us. This free gift was given. There will be some people like those Pharisees and Sadducees who do not want to open their hearts. So they will close their hearts and say, no, I don't want to believe this. I don't want to hear this. Even when they are hearing, they will they'll question what they're hearing, you know, because they are hoping that by through all of their questions, the truth will just go away and they won't have to receive it. So they, are, they have made up their minds that they don't want to be open. So for such people, Jesus Christ calls them brood of vipers. They are beyond hope. There is no redemption for them because they have closed themselves utterly to redemption. But every human being who has this even a little bit of openness, even if it's just one tiny little you know, crack, one little opening, if they're willing to hear, he will start talking to them more. He will bring people into their lives who will, you know, start making them think in terms of salvation and future and eternity. So he will start, um, even if there's a little bit of openness, God will begin his work. And then when that person comes to a point where they are really willing to, you know, hear, he will give them the gift of faith to believe and they will be able to believe. Okay, so it says over here. Even the believing which you did in Jesus Christ, that was not by yourselves. It was the work of God. All along, God did his work, you know, in us. So, um, all right. Uh, if, if um, okay, we, we don't have much time. Time is always a factor. Um, all right. Um, maybe we can just quickly get into verses... 11 to 13. Okay, maybe 11 to 16. If someone could just read out this entire chunk, 11 to 16, you know, let's tackle it. Yeah. Thanks for reading my purpose. Sir, you can go ahead. I, I should go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead, please. 11 to 16. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at the present, and that you were at the time separated from Christ, alienated from the common, commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinance that he might create himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Yeah. So right from the beginning of Ephesians up to you know chapter 2, verse 10, 
he talked about what we have in Christ, how we were in this really helpless position before. And now here we are in a position of authority because Christ Jesus has won all of that for us. So he talks about that. Now, because Christ Jesus has done all of this, verse 11 onwards, he starts addressing the Gentile believers specifically. So based on this, we kind of get the impression that maybe, maybe the Gentile believers were not being given the same status that the Jewish believers were being given. Uh, so maybe because the Jewish believers were still, you know, observing some of the rituals, um, you know, and, and you know, observing the Sabbath and not eating certain foods. Maybe, maybe people treated them with more respect than they did the Gentile believers. So now, Paul wants to make it very, very clear that all of these beautiful things that we have seen, you know, up to verse ten, those are not just for Jewish believers. They are even for Gentile believers. He goes on to establish in the next few verses that the Gentiles have equal status with the Jewish believers. They are in no way inferior in any way. And he uses all of these big, big words to bring out what he is saying. Um, so he talks about what their pathetic condition was before salvation. They were separate from Christ, he says in verse 12. They were excluded from the citizenship in Israel. Uh, it says they were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. They were without hope. They were without God. That was their status, but that was their former status. They are not to be treated like that in the church anymore. In the church, you can't act like as if they're separate from Christ. You have no right to treat them now like as if they're you know, not citizens, that they're excluded. No way are you allowed to treat them as foreigners now. So it's making it very clear that was their status before. But now in verse 13, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near. God himself has brought you near to himself through the blood of Christ. So now nobody can dare you know, point fingers at these Jewish, uh, to, uh, to these uh, Gentile believers and say, oh, you people are not citizens the way we are. No one can act like as if they are inferior in some way. And so he uses very, very strong wording in 14, 15, 16. He says, the barrier that was there between these two, uh, you know, people groups, it has been, and, and he says it was a dividing wall of hostility where um, the Jewish people would say, we are chosen people. You, on the other hand, you're heathen, you're pagans. You see, there was a wall of hostility between these two groups. And this, uh, this wall was broken down. And why does he break down this wall? Why does Jesus Christ break down this wall? Verse 15 says, setting aside in his flesh, the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. And it says in verse 16, and in one body to reconcile both. So verse 15, in his flesh, in himself, in one body. See, this, this is literally Jesus Christ that, that, you know, that's being spoken of over here. Jesus Christ in his body, in his flesh, he chose to bring these two peoples together. So literally, when these people would be having their Lord's Supper, you know, they, they would be having that meal together. They are, you know, eating his body and declaring, oh, we both came to uh, to this, to, to God through the same access by eating Jesus Christ. You know, circumcision didn't do, didn't do anything great for me. The same way the Gentile person has now come to God by eating Jesus, I also have come to God by eating Jesus, nothing to do with mosaic rituals or anything. So over here, he says, in his flesh, in himself, he has created one new humanity out of the two. And in one body, he has reconciled both of them to God. So in God's eyes, these Gentile believers were extremely precious, very important. No way were they allowed to be regarded as inferior. So that was something that he would have, God would have taken very, very seriously because he has personally broken down the wall of hostility that existed uh, between these two people groups. In fact, when you, in, in those days, if you were to go to the Jerusalem temple, you know, you had the outer court, right? The court of the Gentiles. 
and uh, then you have the inner court all the israelites can walk into the inner court happily you know nobody's going to stop them but no gentile would ever enter so josephus you know the ancient historian in his writings he says that there were i think 13 ha huh, 13 stone slabs were placed there was this kind of dividing wall separating the inner and the out uh, in, inner uh, court from the outer court of the gentiles at 13 places you had 13 stone slabs you know uh, with the word of warning written over there gentiles do not proceed further if you proceed further you know what is the wording that is there whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his subsequent death you would be put to death if you entered inside so you know that was the seriousness of it that was the wall of hostility that existed between these two groups and jesus christ in his flesh in his body he breaks down that barrier and he says now these people are also my flock they're part of my flock and nobody should be should speak against them he goes on to talk more about unity and all of that later so we will be looking at that in our next session but for now we are completely totally out of time uh, so let's just close with a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, for the things that we are able to learn through our scriptures. Lord, um, it is a beautiful thing that you have chosen to seat us in the heavenly realms with you. And you have made available to us your resurrection power. Now, Lord, we need to use it uh, in the right way um, to accomplish your divine purposes. So, O oh Lord, we pray that even as we spend time with you in your presence, you would start teaching us how to use the resurrection power that is now available to us. You start teaching us, O oh Lord, how to use your name to accomplish your purposes. This is not available just to people in full-time ministry. It is available to all believers who choose to believe in what you have done for us on the cross. So I pray that you, O oh Lord, would train us and show us how to apply these things in our practical everyday lives. You be our teacher, you be our trainer, O oh Lord, because that is what you have released your Holy Spirit for. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for sticking it out right up to the end. And That's we'll meet again next class. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. We don't have the PDF for Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. Oh my, thank you for telling me that. I will post it today. I'll definitely do it now immediately. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Thanks for reminding me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the class. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.